All right. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone, whichever time zone you're in. Um, thank you so much for coming out to the Black Maternal Health Conference and engaging in this really important conference about really important topics. And I hope it's been really fruitful and beneficial for everyone here. Um, so we are going to end with our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Macklemore. Yay. <laughs> um, so with Dr. Oh, first let me introduce myself. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Beverly Debbie and I'm a sophomore at Tufts University. I'm majoring in community health on the pre-med track um, and minoring in Spanish. I'm also in the mother lab, which is the logo right behind me, um, which Dr. Ao is the um, PI for. So I'm really excited to be here. And I'm also a volunteer for this Black Maternal Health Conference. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. So at the University of California, San Francisco, um, Monica Macklemore is a tenured associate professor in the Family Healthcare Nursing Department and affiliated scientist with advancing new standards in re reproductive health and a member of the Bixby Center for the Global Reproductive Health. Uh, she retired from clinical practice as a public health and staff nurse after a 28 year clinical nursing career. So long time. Um, her program of research is focused on understanding reproductive health and justice. She has 49 peer-reviewed articles, op-eds, and commentaries, and her research has been cited in the Huffington Post, Lavender Health, two amicus briefs to the Supreme Court of the United States, and a National Academics of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report. Her work has been appeared in publications such as Day Magazine, Politico, ProPublica slash NPR, and she has made a voice appearance in Terrence Nance HBO series, Random Act of Flyness. <laughs> Her work was published in the 2019 Future of Medicine edition of Scientific American as a data visualization project entitled How to Fix Maternal Mortality. The first step is to stop blaming women, and that's a fact. She is an elected member of the Gov Governing Council for the Sexual and Reproductive Health Section of the American Public Health Association and is the incoming chair elect of the SRH section. She is the recipient of numerous awards and was inducted into the American Ac Academy of Nursing in October of 2019. So thank you so much for being here. Um, you're amazing and I'm excited to hear you talk. Woo! It's almost Black Maternal Health Awareness Week, yay! Um, first of all, thank you everybody for being here. Um, you have my affirmative consent to be able to, uh, you know, screenshot or social media. You have my consent to do all of those things. I want to thank my sister from another mister and my co-person from Jersey uh, in Didi Maka. I, I just love you and thank you for such a, an awesome conference. I have to send y'all my updated bio though, because people who know me know I write a lot published 14 papers last year. So gotta, gotta send y'all the updated bio. Anyway, um, first of all, for the attendees, thank you for being here. I am going to share my screen um, because I wanna talk to you about something that I've been working about, uh, working on for a little bit. Um, and I'm just, I, I can't believe I'm following like Jeannie Josephs and Chanel and all the incredible speakers who, you know, are such deep thinkers about this work. And so one of the things I really want to do is to push us to be even bolder in terms of what we expect, what we demand, and what we think we deserve, um, in particular to Black maternal health crisis. Because I think, you know, we've spent a lot of time describing the harm and trying to mitigate that harm. And I want to push us to the place where we can actually reimagine and give us a language, a tool, and a framework to think about how to be able to do that. So before I start, you know, I will, um, I use the pronoun she and her, um, and I really will attempt to use as gender neutral language as I can out of both respect and scientific accuracy. Um, I have been trying to think about what's been gumming up our capacity to have important discussions about not only black maternal health, but reproductive health rights and justice across the life course. And what I realized early on in my career is we all not having the same conversation because some people are retrofitters, some people are reformers, and some people are reimaginers. And being able to identify which conversation you're having when, in my opinion, is, is, is a skill that we all need to develop so that we can actually get on the same page to be able to optimize, align, and leverage strategies that I think are super important. 
for people who know me, you know I will start with where I come to this work from. Um, and I think it's super, super important that we all remember that like there are multiple ways of knowing. So I was enough at Black Woman, right? I mean, as my good colleague and collaborator, Jessica Roach from The Root Doulas always says, we, we were enough at Black Woman. But because there's hierarchies and ways of knowing, you know, I will sort of put out there my positionality in doing this work. <clears throat> so let's start. Number one, birth is not the only legitimate outcome of pregnancy. So please don't assume that that's something that, that I believe. I think with surrogacy, with abortion, with miscarriage, with, you know, all sorts of different ways that we think about pregnancy. Let's remember pregnancy is the condition. Just because we've only studied the outcomes doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other outcomes. Um, I'd like to remind any audience I talk to that most people will spend their adult lives trying to avoid pregnancy. If you're lucky enough to be, you know, have your fertile window be from 15 to 45, you know, you might actually spend 30 years trying not to be pregnant in order to get those two to three kids that you actually want, right? So we need to sort of widen our aperture in terms of what we think about. And, you know, as I get older, you know, I love life course theory and thinking about intergenerational change and how we think about policy and education and clinical practice. Uh, it, we need a broader frame when we're talking about, you know, people with capacity for pregnancy. So I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna talk a little bit about maternal health. I'm gonna talk about California. I'm gonna talk about disparities and racism. Um, but, you know, shout out to Justice, you know, and may she rest in peace. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I, I agree. I think the courts um, have always ventured into a minefield because they don't center the people who actually could best inform them about how to achieve reproductive health rights and justice. So I, I big fan. Let's start off with some places when we talk about Black maternal health that nobody wants to talk about that has been like shown a huge light during COVID-19. We have had so many uh, obstetric unit closures. We've had so many mergers uh, between hospitals and healthcare institutions, whether they were public, religiously affiliated or other, that, that this has a huge impact on health services that have rippled down effects that a lot of people don't appreciate or understand. A lot of people don't know, and this is one of the reasons why I did a recent webinar looking at pregnant capable people and triage and emergency departments, because what happens is when you lose an obstetrical unit, most of those people then end up having to go to emergency services. And a lot of people are quite surprised to find out that emergency nurses don't get a lot of training in obstetrics. Why? Because historically we've been really good about having OB triage that, that can manage those conditions so that pregnant people don't have to go to the emergency department, all right? All these unintended consequences of the decisions that we make. Then you got a situation where you got fake clinics, we got misinformation, we had the gutting of Title X. So you have all those people who were trying to avoid pregnancy for those 30 years, you know, if, if they only want two to three kids, which is the average in the United States, you've got people not knowing where to go for correct information, right? Then you have a situation where, and I don't have to tell this audience, it's where pregnant people do go into the hospital. And I like to remind folks that pregnancy and childbirth prior to COVID-19 remain the number one reason why people were admitted to hospitals in the United States. We have like 4 million births. Let me say that again. Childbirth and pregnancy remains the number one reason why people in the United States are admitted to hospitals, right? So we know about mistreatment. This is work we did with the birthplace lab. One in six people, regardless of race and ethnicity, talked about being mistreated during their pregnancy and birth, which Dr. Karen Scott has taught us, it, it, along with Dr. Diane Ian Davis. It's a sacred time, right? Mistreatment. And I always tell people that mistreatment and clinician burnout are two sides of the same coin. Why? Because our workplaces are inhumane. It doesn't work for any of us, not the patients and not the providers, right? When you think about the levels of mistreatment, right? Being shouted at, people coming in your room, violating privacy, threatening to withhold treatment. Like in my mind, that screams, there's something wrong with the in entire environment of care, not just the individuals who are seeking care and those of us who work in those environments. I don't have to tell you all this, right? Near misses. This, I, it amazes me that this actually was published three years ago. Olympia is, is walking y'all, right? <laughs> But if you're less inclined, if your team is in conflict with each other, nobody's listening to you, 
Didn't we find that with, out with the sad video with Dr. Susan Moore and COVID, right? If you're like less inclined to be believed and when even when you are a physician or it's your job as a, you know, like millionaire person who makes your income based on your the physical capacity of your body to work and people don't believe you, right? These are near misses. Then a couple months later, we had to like, see all the misinformation around toxemia of pregnancy, which many of us call preeclampsia, right? There were inaccurate information and decreased access like on people's websites, even our own university website. At where I'm at, at UCSF, our social media was up to date in terms of information around toxemia of pregnancy. But this study from ProPublica found that Mayo Clinic and Harvard and, and even UCSF had old or outdated science on our standing permanent websites where the public was trying to go to to get information. Not everybody uses social media, right? So it's this, 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 this storm of how are we gonna mix all this stuff together and then come up with a way to be able to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality, right? How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna understand that between 50 and 60% of cases in maternal morbidity and mortality are considered preventable? How can we do that if we're not all having the same conversation? Here in California, where everybody likes to lift up our, our data, you don't have to be a statistician to see that blue line. That's Black people, Black birthing people. Everybody else are all the other lines when you look at maternal morbidity and mortality in our state. So even though we've done really, really well, we still got a ton of work to do, right? When we think about maternal morbidity and mortality rates rising, and this was pre-COVID data, we just reported on some data, you know, that are currently under review showing that the preterm birth rates have been rising, and we are concerned that the maternal mortality rates will be rising in the context of COVID, right? Let me show you guys uh, a uh, conceptual framework that moves all of the work that I do. I got this from Dr. Joya Career Perry. It comes from uh, this chapter uh, in the book uh, uh, that's about health disparities. We all know that social determinants of health are born from the structural determinants of health, right? You don't just get transportation and availability of food and quality of education and having a living wage. That just doesn't come out of thin air. Those are policy decisions that we make. Right, so it's time to have an authentic conversation about where the social determinants of health come from. They don't come out of air. They come out of policy decisions and policy decisions come from the people we elect. And that's the connection that you need to make as to why it's so important that when people think about democracy and how it potentially was breached on January 6th, it, it all connects very clearly in my mind because the social determinants are born from the structural determinants. When I say structural racism, and we saw the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention declare racism as a public health crisis, something the American Public Health Association did in 2015 under the leadership of Dr. Kamara Jones. When I talk about structural racism, this is what I'm talking about. This is work from Dr. Brittany Chambers. This is the definition uh, that we used in this paper. It's systematic laws, it's processes, it's policies and procedures that differentially access services, goods, opportunities, to people of different races. It's not that difficult, right? We're not, I'm not talking about individual uh, mediated racism. We're talking about structures. Again, citing Dr. Joy Career Perry, we know that racism, the risk factor racism is when we think about, you know, historically excluded groups, there's a reason they were historically excluded. So we have to start having very, we have to use accurate both scientifically and historically accurate language when we're trying to have conversations and discussions about this work. I wrote this a year ago, and I still believe this a year ago, stand by every word. This whole idea that we were barring accompaniment when we're shepherding new humans to this plane, we, we got a moral crisis going on if we actually continue to think that that's a good idea. And yet a week later, colleagues and clinicians thought it was a good idea to try and make the exact opposite case. We're not having the same conversation. 
even now, this is a data, data dashboard from uh, uh, some of the pregnancy registries at UCSF that we're working on, where we're trying to understand COVID and pregnancy and what that looks like. Still not having the same conversation because you got some people over here talking about misinformation and vaccine hesitancy, but like really not really teasing that apart and being lazy using sound points um, that I think are not helpful because Black people have historic and current reasons to be mistrustful of the healthcare system. The real question is, what are we as healthcare providers doing to become more trustworthy? That is the way I actually think about this. So finally had some time to sit down and think about how can we get everybody on the same page to have these discussions. And I've come up with the three R's. Some people are trying to be retrofitters. Some people are trying to be reformers and some people are trying to be reimaginers. And here's the cliff note. We all can't be the same three at the same time, right? We need everybody doing a piece of each one of these if we're really gonna resolve the black maternal health crisis. So let me tell you what I mean. These come straight out of Merriam-Webster Okay, these are definitions. Retrofit is a verb, and this is really important because it's an action term. If you look at the third definition, you're trying to adapt to a new purpose or a need. What retrofitters don't explicitly say is they expect that the way things are will remain the way that they are. We just want to add something to it or we're going to repurpose it. The main structure doesn't go away. Okay, in contrast, Reformers are trying to transform those structures into something else, right? It may not be in the, in the current manifestation of itself as like, I'm, I'm not going to be the 1.0 version, I'm going to be the 2.0 version. Or I'm not the iPhone 1, I'm the iPhone 10, right? Similar structure, but very different, right? As opposed to just retrofitting the iPhone 1 and adding a whole lot of apps to it, okay? Okay. Reimaginers, I think this is where a lot of Black women and people who work with Black women sit um, because we want something new, right? And so you can imagine it's a really difficult conversation when you got people who don't expect the stuff in the now to exist and, 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 and trying not to use the master's tools, right? That Those are three different conversations. And, and, and what I've come to understand or what I've come to think is we need all three of these. And, and let me give you the moral argument why I say that. I think everybody wants to be in, in a utopia that is better for the people we serve and for ourselves. The problem is I refuse to abandon the people in the now for the utopia we all dream of, right? So we have to have people working on different pieces of this because otherwise, if everybody's on team utopia, then what about the folks who need care now? What about the students who are being harmed by our institutions now? Like, I think we're smart enough to chew gum and walk. So let me tell you how I think about this. Why do we need all three? If you think about it, one is a past orientation, one is a present orientation, one is a future orientation. That's the easiest way to think about this. And I'm writing about this now because I think it's really important for all of us to understand that we need all three of these. So let's add it to Black maternal health. You saw my previous slides, right? I already told you why obstetric services um, and the loss of them are problematic. So let me, let me move to, okay, the retrofit is let's reopen those units. The reform is let's train other staff to have those skills. That's why I did the webinar for emergency nurses so they know a little bit more about OB triage and can be more competent and confident in their skills. Let's expand home visiting, nurse family partnership. Let's change the birth settings. But then you got a whole group of reimaginers of people who really wanted to set up auxiliary maternity units outside. Let's use hotels for, you know, so we can provide greater access to midwives so we can have birth centers like in the hotel, right? That's why we're not all having the same conversation. And this is just one example. Let me show you another one, okay? From the Title X situation, okay, a retrofit is, we already saw the Biden and Harris administration do the executive orders to get rid of the Mexico policy. We've already seen some rules uh, that we're expecting next week to change for Title X. A reform could be, let's have some partner services. Can't we have collated, located services like the incredible team at Choices in Memphis that Dr. Nikia Grayson is leading with a whole lot of Black midwives, collaborators, colleagues, and friends? Why can't we put those services together? 
We know that that's more cost effective and more uh, satisfactory uh, to patients in the oncology arena. That's why we have regional cancer centers. That's why we have comprehensive cancer centers. One-stop shop, you get everything in one place. That's a reform. But a reimagine is we would use reproductive justice to completely rework the entire workforce to rethink how does this not happen, right? That's why we not all having the same conversation. And scarcity makes retrofit reform and reimagine a real problem because then everybody wants to just retrofit everything because people are afraid of loss. And that's a whole other lecture that I'm probably going to do later on this fall. I want to give you a, a concrete example of how we've done this here in uh, Alameda County in Oakland, where I live. And we did a study around trying to think about, you know, if we were really going to retrofit and reform and reimagine an existing program, how will we do it? That's what this work is. In California, we have a program called the Comprehensive Perinatal Services Program. It's an add-on supplement dollars uh, to the Medicaid program that allows for us to be able to screen for social determinants of health and to be able to connect people with referrals and services to food and childcare and diapers and transportation, a whole variety of other things, right? We wanted to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality. We wanted to make sure that CPSP visits, that's what we call it, were available and that people knew about it and that we would be able to have rapid referral and not have to disrupt clinic flow, right? Retrofit. We were not making this a whole separate program. We, were, we wanted it to, to happen in the context of a general healthcare visit. What we wanted to also do was to do it across clinics. Right, that was the reform. Okay, so we're gonna try this out in one environment. What situations and circumstances needs, need to change in all these other environments to make this work in this clinical environment, right? That's a reform, right? Instead of just taking the, the program and say, you have to implement this program the exact same way in all the different you know, clinics, that doesn't make any sense. We all know you gotta customize stuff to your environment, right? That's a retrofit, right? And by reforming it across different uh, spectrum, people could customize the different parts that were available to their clinical population. So what we did, we did a qualitative study. We wanted to interview folks, right? Because the numer numbers here are not helpful. And that's the other thing. You have to understand that your scientific method has to match the kind of work that you're doing. When you're trying to do revolutionary and emancipation work, numbers are not going to be helpful to you. And I know that makes me unpopular as a scientist, but I'm just saying it's, it's not helpful. Numbers are helpful when you're trying to tell a story. They're very helpful when you want to retrofit something because you're measuring something in real time that's already in existence that's in the current environment. Emancipatory work means we need new methods, right? We did 25 interviews across 12 clinic sites, the Alameda, Alameda County uh, clinic Consortium, which is a nonprofit organization here, here in, in Alameda County. It operates all the federally qualified health centers, all the community-based clinics. And so there are some that have multiple sites. So we went to 12 sites. We wanted to talk to staff, providers, uh, CPSP workers. We wanted to talk to folks to really, really understand how could we do this in a retrofit, in a reform, and in a re reimagine. This is work that a learner led, uh, Ms. Fionn Ng, who was a family nurse practitioner student. It was her master's thesis. Always support students. That's a reform. We talked to people. Um, we had a wide range, uh, one, uh, two Latinx, uh, one Asian person, one African-American, one white person. Um, they all identified as, as female in terms of their, or cis uh, females as in their gender. Um, good range in terms of their average role as community health workers. And this is the community health worker data. And again, centering the margins in research means I don't privilege the providers. Let's privilege the people who are actually doing the work. So I'm only showing you the data from the community health workers because they have a lot to say. This is a national webinar and amplifying and lifting up voices and, and being really serious about passing the mic means you center the margins. So I'm not showing you the physician data. I'm showing the community health worker data. They said it was very, very important that there are many barriers to screening for social determinants of health and making referrals. One was clinic organization, the structure of the actual questionnaire, and then like actual different patients have different needs. The other thing that they called out very clearly was this is a team effort and when the team works is great. When the team don't work, it sucks, right? <laughs> That's a really important insight. 
especially as we start to think about retrofit and reform and, and reimagine. What teams do we need to assemble to get the work done? And what processes can we put into place to say, you know what, mm, this is not the right team without looking for an enemy or a villain, right? Because sometimes it's just not the right team and that's okay. Uh, one of the other things that I thought was super, super important is they gave us a way to fix it. They gave us a way to retrofit some of the problems. And so what we did was we changed the questionnaire and we got the, the clinicians greater involved. So my final point, let's all have the same discussion. Let's try to get all on, the, like get acclimated with this question in your mind. Hmm, I'm really curious here. Are you thinking we should retrofit what, what we're already doing? Should we reform it? Or maybe can we completely redo it? Which conversation you wanna have today? Cause I have ideas around both. How can we distribute resources based on need? And how can we allow, a lot of people talk about divide and conquer. No, I want divide and success. How can we divide and success? How can we get people to retrofit, to reform and to reimagine and have everybody be okay being in that space and that time? Because don't get me wrong, I wanna be on team reimagine all the time. But as the long tenured black associate professor at my university, not only in my school, but at my university, there are students in the now who need my help. There are faculty in the now who need my help. So I always can't be reimagining because some stuff does need to be retrofit, right? We need a clearer articulation and communication of which conversation we are having, right? If we don't do this, I am concerned that we will continue to make fear-based decisions out of scarcity because we don't, we're not, we don't have the maturity or the language to really say which conversation we're having. Now, one thing I have not talked about is cost, whether it's human money or time costs, because I don't think money is the only thing when we, we should be talking about when we talk about resources, right? We're also talking about humans, we're also talking about money, and we're also talking about time. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because that's my last slide, um, because I do wanna have a discussion and answer some of your questions. But one of the things that I think is really important is that, that retrofit reform and reimagine the, 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 the resource piece always comes last after you figure out which conversation you're having. Because in retrofits, a lot of time, there are no additional resources. There's no new humans, there's no new money, there's no new time, right? So, but in reforms, there might be because you're willing to change the, the, the base structure or the foundational thing, like you're, you're willing to change that. So you might be freeing up some humans, you might be freeing up some money, you might be freeing up some time because you're not expecting for that source thing to stay the same. And reimagine, talking about resources is actually not helpful because then you can't imagine how it could be different if you're still constraining yourself to the rules of retrofit and reform, right? I mean, who knew, like, like let, let's, let's use a, a pop culture reference here. Who knew that Club Quarantine with Be Nice would open up a whole new way to think about how to engage with dance, music, a DJ, and a club, right? Had he already thought about that money-making side of it, that we probably would have got a very different product. He went in his living room and was like, okay, the people are hurting. We all need to get together. Let's play some music. Come on, y'all, right? The money piece came after, the verses came after, right? So you gotta, let's all, we all got to get on the same page around where we're going and what we're doing. And that requires curating different discussions and knowing which one we're having where and which one we're having with whom. So with that, you know, I'm who, who gonna help me with some questions? Cause you know, I get confused and you know, like the, the extrovert in me is really excited looking at that chat. I'm like, oh, I want to go read through that entire chat. Right. But I know we have some questions. So I want to be mindful of the conference and the time and be able to answer the questions. And yes, my slides will be available. And yes, I'm writing a paper about this. Cause I think we really need to be able to do this. I think we can lead this and transform health service provision, health policy and education. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was just like so enlightening. And I feel like I want to do like research now on like every single thing you said. Um, so hopefully like all of the people that are on this call, we can like connect with each other and you know, like get something started. Um, so we're going to hop into the Q&A. So the yep, first question got. is from Lupita Rodriguez. 
Um, they asked, do you have suggestions for ways doulas can advocate for change at a legislative level? Yes, I do. So um, sadly, uh, we right before COVID hit last year here in California, we had introduced a comprehensive doula bill that would have created an 18 county, there are 58 counties in California, an 18 county Medicaid uh, doula reimbursement project where they would be eligible for uh, federal, or sorry, state dollars from our Medicaid program, um, where there were black infant health programs here in California, which is a you know social support and, and badass organization that I really love that support black birthing people. Um, and that got pulled because it got introduced at the height of the pandemic. It has yet to be reintroduced and I'm really frustrated about that. However, that said, we have a statewide momnibus. And if you don't know the momnibus, the federal one that the Black Maternal Caucus has reintroduced, Lauren Underwood and Alma Adams reintroduced that. It has 12 bills in it at the federal level to really do a lot of work. And three of them are specifically geared towards uh, creating money for doulas to do statewide work. Here in California, we have our own version of Momnibus. I believe it's uh, Senate Bill 64 from Nancy Skinner uh, that has many of the uh, issues uh, that we would like to see doulas be able to receive power, including money, but also a voice to be able to do some of that work. So if you Google Nancy Skinner SB 64, you should see where it outlines what doulas can be doing in their own states to introduce legislation around advocating for the important and incredible work that you do outside of comfort measures and the episodic moment of birth, all that important upstream work you do in the prenatal period and all that uh, perinatal mental health support that you provide people. Yeah, there's language both in the in the state, California state momnibus and language in the federal momnibus that you should be borrow and steal and use in your state to be able to, to uh, amplify the important work that you do. I love doulas, shout out to the doulas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and our second question is from Mercy. So she says, hi, Dr. Nakamura, I'm a student researcher and I'm interested in the data surrounding maternal mortality, pregnancy compl complications, et cetera. Um, do you have any advice for finding data sets that house this information on a hospital by hospital basis? Uh, yes and no. So let me start off with the data problem. So as a reminder, uh, we didn't have good federal data sources on maternal morbidity and mortality because they stopped collecting those data in 2007. We actually literally just started recollecting and compiling those data at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That said, um, I've recently been reading Dear Science from Dr. Katherine McKittrick, who is a Black identified Black studies um, and gender policy person um, in Canada. And one of the interesting things she talks about is this notion that if we can't imagine Black joy, Black liberation, and Black life outside of what we believe is premature death, then our scientific data and our statistics are flawed because the way that we model them doesn't include the possibility of life. So I'm really wrestling with that. That's a whole other discussion, but it's important that we not only focus on death data and harm data, or as Dr. Karen Scott calls it, you know, black death trauma porn, um, but we are collecting data at university levels as well as the CDC has begun to collect uh, death certificate data. The maternal morbidity and mortality reviews is another potential data source. Um, and then some universities, um, you want to look at Dr. Elizabeth Howell's work. She used to be in New York, um, and now she's the uh, uh, department chair of obstetrics and gynecology at Penn. She's done a lot of work compiling data, but there's no one data source. They have to be compiled from different types of data because we don't have a national health service. See, that's another problem. We have no systemic way of getting health outcome data on the citizens in our country because we don't have a national health service, right? We don't have a single payer to be able to do that. So they have to be compiled from different data sources. Um, and CDC, again, doesn't always collect data. They compile data that are being collected by hospitals and other healthcare institutions. I will push you to uh, look at Darren, uh, Dr. Karen Scott's sacred birth study because she's been doing a lot of hospital-based quality improvement um, and, and collecting data, those exact kind of data that you're looking for from hospitals and healthcare institutions as well. So those are just a couple of different places where you could triangulate, triangulate the data that you're looking for. 
Thank you so much. I know that we had more questions left. Um, if you guys want to ask them in Whova, we can definitely use that platform and converse more and share ideas. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Macklemore. I learned so much from you. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Bathsheba, um, Dr. Bathsheba Riso, who is the co-chair um, of the Black Maternal Health Conference to introduce Dr. Um, A.O. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. McLemore. And thank you every one of you who attended this conference today. Um, obviously there's so many places that you guys could be, but you chose to be here with us. And that means the world to our group who hosted this. And we're happy to be involved with making a space where we can discuss these very important topics and trying to see that black maternal health improves in our country. And maybe we can even set this stage for different health disparities that we see all over the world. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Bathsheba Oriso and I'm the co-chair of this conference. And it was an absolutely amazing experience uh, being able to be with you all and meet you all virtually and not behind the computer screen as we have been during these past couple months. Um, although I'm sure many of us would wish that our time together today could be extended, um, it is that time for us to bring uh, today to a close. But before you guys go, um, we want to go ahead and make you aware of some upcoming events that we have uh, at the end of our program uh, to continue those conversations that we started today. So the first one would be a networking session. Um, everyone will be divided into two groups and one group will go from 4 to 4.30, the other will go from 4.30 to 5. And at the same time, we also want to meet you as part of Mother Lab for a meet and greet session. So if you're not in the networking session, you can hop into the Mother Lab meet and greet, and then we can swap places. And that is how we'll wrap up this final hour. And lastly, we definitely want to hear back from you all. Uh, we want to know about your experiences, what are things that were really encouraging, what are things that we could improve on so that we continue to build and grow this conference um, and continue to see that the promotion that we're trying to achieve in our mission is ultimately fulfilled through your help. Um, lastly, as I bring this uh, program to a close, it's my pleasure to reintroduce us to my co-chair and the founder of the Black Maternal Health Conference, uh, Dr. Ndidi Amaka Muto Nukaga. Um, we will leave you guys with the closing remarks. Um, and again, it was a pleasure to work with you all during our fourth annual Black Maternal Health Conference. We did this during the pandemic, y'all. And it has been an absolute pleasure um, and a, an amazing experience. So thank you. And we'll go ahead and play our closing address now. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time, energy, attention, and knowledge here today. Believe it or not, we've made it to the end of the fourth annual Black Maternal Health Conference. Now, while today's programming here has ended, this doesn't mean our conversation and the lessons learned, the relationships built and fostered need to stop here. We need to continue to talk about doulas in spaces we enter, spaces that we are in on a daily basis, spaces that we create room for ourselves to enter and continue to give doulas the respect and time they deserve as essential care workers. So whether you've joined us as an undergraduate student in your first year of college or as a public health <laughs> professional in the midst of a successful and hefty career, I hope that today has left you feeling empowered, educated, and energized. I also wanna give a huge shout out to all our midwives, our community doulas, our telehealth doulas, our certified professional midwives, our community members, our healthcare workers, our patient navigators, and everyone else that's been here today. If you leave here today with only one message in mind, let it be this. We must continue to center doulas in our work all throughout maternal health and healthcare and support the efforts of community-led reproductive health equity initiatives. From funding the work of doulas, from getting doulas reimbursed, to really examining and funding community doula training programs in underserved communities, to supporting doulas of all certifications, all backgrounds and experiences, to really giving doulas the space they need to deliver services and support birthing people during labor and delivery. There are many ways that we can keep doulas at the center of our work. 
I invite you to also keep up with us after this conference, mainly through our Mother Lab website, www.motherlab.org, the work of March, the work of the Maternal and Child Health Journal Club, and the plethora of other projects and events our brilliant young scholars, members, volunteers are leading. Thank you again for a very successful and informative conference today. I am already excited and looking forward to our fifth annual conference next year and all that that will bring. Take good care and thank you again. For more information on Mother Lab, please visit our website, www.motherlab.org. Follow us on Instagram at mother underscore lab. Follow us on Twitter at motherlab20. You can find us on LinkedIn as well. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you to all of our generous sponsors. Thank you to all our family members, our community members, and most importantly, thank you to the participants and to the volunteers. We can't wait to see you next year at our fifth annual conference. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much.